President Biden is in Europe for the next week, where he'll attend the G7 summit, followed by NATO and U.S.-EU summits in Brussels. During his trip, he's seeking allies as he engages China. Will he get them? Joining me now to discuss this and much more is Asia expert, author, and columnist Gordon Chang. Gordon, thanks for being here. This is Biden's first overseas trip as president. Uh, upon landing in England, Biden told troops this was the goal of his trip. Listen. At every point along the way, we're going to make it clear that the United States is back and democracies of the world are standing together to tackle the toughest challenges and the issues that matter most to our future, that we're committed to leading with strength, defending our values, and delivering for our people. Gordon, he later said climate change was the greatest threat to national security. Your reaction to that, and do, do you believe that the world is hearing America is back? Well, first of all, you know, Biden said that climate change, greatest national security threat. Well, that was on a day where um, the U.S. hit the mark of 598,760 deaths from a disease that China deliberately spread beyond its borders. Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, lied about contagiousness. He locked down his own countries while forcing others to take passengers from China. This was malicious. So I found that that statement was, um, I don't really know the word for it, Raymond, but uh, it was really wrong for him to say that. And, and you know, the, the U.S. hasn't gone anywhere. Um, the U.S. has had stronger relations with its allies in the Middle East and Asia than it did under President Obama. Yes, there was trouble between Trump and Europe, but that's because Trump told the Europeans things that they had to hear and which no American president before him was willing to say. So I, I found mm -hmm. Biden's comments to be just wrongheaded, misguided, and really a misreading of history. Well, what kind of support can Biden expect with our European allies vis-a-vis -vis China? He seems more concerned about Russia, frankly. Yeah, I, I don't know how much he's going to get the big issue is Germany. Germany, with Angela Merkel, has been very pro-China. But Merkel is not going to seek a fifth term as chairman of the party. So she'll be stepping down this year. And the question is, who's going, you know, is there a replacement going to be that uh, strong pro-China? I think not, um, because there is a change in attitude among uh, European populations. So I think that Biden will get a little bit of the way where he wants to go but not as far, because he's going to encounter, I think, the uh, elites who are still very, very pro-Beijing uh, in the EU. It's been reported that Biden is hoping to forge like-minded coalitions to rebuke China over the crackdown on the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, repression of the Uyghurs, uh, aggressive military activity in the South and East China Seas. However, earlier this year, French President Emmanuel Macron said he wanted to, quote, avoid a scenario where multiple countries join together against China, fearing that it would be counterproductive because it will push China to increase its regional strategy and cooperate less on issues of joint concern, end quote. Now, Europe seems petrified of offending China. Uh, Gordon, your thoughts? Well, that certainly was true when Macron said that. Um, I think that there has been a change in European opinion, and we saw that uh, a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. when the European Parliament froze implementation on the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, which is something that Beijing really wanted. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. Macron and the other elites, as I talked about, they're still very much in Beijing's camp, and Biden's going to have to work a lot harder than he thinks um, to get them on his side. But, you know, over time, I do believe that uh, European populations will eventually push their leaders in a much better direction. But time is a big issue because we got to deal with China now, not two or three years from now. Yeah, well, picking up on what you said, over the last year, several European countries, including the U.K., France and Germany, have become more willing to send Navy ships to the South China Sea to reinforce that U.S. message. Uh, to China about the freedom of navigation. The U.S. has been very vocal about China's overreach in Hong Kong and Taiwan. How much does the U.S. and European presence in the South China Sea deter China from being more forceful toward Hong Kong and Taiwan and the region overall? 
Well, the number of ships that European countries are sending are really small. But uh, Beijing is absolutely berserk about it because they do see that there is uh, a, a willingness on the part of the EU and European countries um, to work with the U.S., work with India, Australia, Taiwan, Japan, uh, Vietnam. So that's really a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. So it's more symbolic than anything else. But for China, s symbolism matters. And so they're really upset mm -hmm. with this. Yeah. And th th their designs on Taiwan seem to be, uh, and the, the noises they're making about Taiwan seem to be increasing. Um, should they make a move against uh, Taiwan? What do you think the U.S. and the European reaction will be at this point under this administration? That's a great question, because um, I don't think the Biden team has actually thought that through. Um, I would hope that they would uh, honor American commitments to the island. They should, um, because Taiwan is absolutely crucial to the defense of the U.S. from a number of different perspectives. Um, so I, I do hope that uh, they would follow um, their basic instincts. But the one thing about Biden, and this is really troubling, is that uh, he wants Beijing's cooperation on climate change, on an Iran nuke deal. And so he's not sending the right messages on Taiwan and other things that he should be. And I think that that's encouraging Beijing to be even more provocative than it otherwise would mm -hmm. be. That could cause the crisis that everyone wants to avoid. So I'm really worried about their general posture towards mm -hmm. China. Yeah, as am I. Uh, last week, President Biden signed an executive order expanding restrictions on American investments in 59 Chinese companies with ties to the country's military and surveillance efforts. Now, this is the same approach that former President Donald Trump took with Beijing. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin had this to say about the restrictions. He said the U.S. should respect the rule of law and the market correct its mistakes and stop actions that undermine the global financial market order and investors' lawful rights and interests. Are these restrictions effective uh, in your mind, Gordon, on the Chinese government's response? Does it, does it stop them in any way or at least give them pause? It certainly gives them pause. It's a move in the right direction. Um, it was welcome. I, I didn't know whether the Biden uh, team would actually extend the Trump rules. But we have seen the Biden team do some things which I've, you know, just undercut that. So, for instance, uh, just yesterday, um, they um, announced that they are no longer going to try to ban TikTok and WeChat uh, from the U.S., right. where they clearly should be doing that. And they've done some other things that are undercut Trump initiatives, which are meant to protect the U.S. So right now, the Biden team is doing some good things and some horrible things. And I think until they actually finish their China review strategy, which they should have done by now, but they're still at it, um, I don't know if we're going to get a clear direction from the White House. Well, the, this TikTok and WeChat, uh, these apps, uh, the Trump administration and, and Mike Pompeo had identified them as uh, apps that collect users' personal data and have connections to Chinese military and intelligence activities. Why would they just, uh, you know, by fiat, just say, oh, well, we don't have any more concerns about it. I mean, surely there are active concerns here, considering the ubiquity of TikTok. I mean, every kid in America has this thing on their phone. Which means that China is illegally collecting data from every kid in America. TikTok is, was caught twice last year um, collecting data where they should not have been, according to U.S. law. Also, a Radio Free Asia reports that uh, the Chinese military used TikTok to send videos to people likely to participate in Black Lives Matter and Antifa protests, and those videos were how to riot. So this was more than just subversion. This mm -hmm. was an act of war. Um, and, and there's another issue here, and that is, look, China doesn't allow American apps in China, so why do we allow Chinese apps in ours? Uh, even if TikTok were innocent, which it's not, but even mm -hmm. if it were, that we shouldn't be allowing it here. So, yeah, I found that to be an inexplicable move on the part of the Biden administration. Really, really wrong. No, frankly, I think that's more dangerous than, uh, you know, restricting the investment in some ways, because this is burrowing into every home and every phone in America. It's, it's not only surveilling, as you said, it's messaging from inside the country. Very dangerous. Uh, June 4th marked the 32nd anniversary of the massacre 
at Tiananmen Square. And since then, the human rights abuses in China have not abated in any way. Cardinal Joseph Zen, who's been on this show many times, I know you know him well, uh, Gordon, he held a mass to commemorate the occasion. Uh, before the mass, the Chinese put up posters like the one you're seeing now. Those Chinese characters up top spell out devil, and beneath the cardinal's picture is a priest with horns. Gordon, your reaction to this, is this sort of normal operating procedure from the Chinese? They didn't disrupt the mass, but they certainly tried to frame it in a certain way. Yes, this is certainly what Beijing's been trying to do. And to put this into a broader context, um, we have seen over the last year a renewed attempt to eliminate Christianity from China. Um, and it's Beijing has been relentless. You know, of course, what they're doing to the Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other Turkic minorities, what they're doing to the Tibetans, they could very well be doing that to, to Christians in the not-too-distant future. Um, this is serious, and we've got to protect Christians on the mainland. They are some of the most hardy, the bravest souls on this earth. Um, we've got to do something. Biden says that he wants, you know, when he was running for president, that he was going to be the human rights president. Well, now he's got an opportunity to do something about it, and he has an obligation to do something about it. And yet we have seen inaction from 1600 Pennsylvania. Mm. No, the, Hong Kong has been ceded, and I fear Taiwan's going to go the same way. What should the U.S. and European countries be doing to stop these human rights abuses going on in China, uh, Gordon? Or, or is it more sanctions? Does, is that effective? Well, I think what would be effective is if um, countries went to the International Olympic Committee and demanded that the mm. Winter Olympics next year be moved from Beijing. Um, also, I believe that uh, we should be telling the IOC that they should be banning um, Chinese participation in any Olympics because significant portions of the Chinese population are not permitted to engage in sport. The IOC in 1963 banned South Africa for that very same reason, but China's abuses are worse than South Africa's. So um, this would be extremely effective because those games are critically important to Beijing right now. Mm -hmm. I want to play something for our audience and get your thoughts on this. During a school board meeting in Virginia this week, a Chinese woman who suffered under Mao's regime vehemently denounced the school board for its championing of critical race theory. Listen. I've been very alarmed about what's going on in our school. You are now teaching, training our children to be social justice warriors and to loathe our country and our history. Uh, growing up in Mao's China, all this seemed very familiar. The uh, communist regime used the same critical theory to divide people. The only difference is they use class instead of race. During the Cultural Revolution, I witnessed students and teachers again turn against each other. We changed school names to be politically correct. Um, we were taught to denounce our heritage. The Red Guards destroy anything that is not communist. Old uh, statues, books, and anything else. <clears throat> we are also encouraged to report on each other, just like the uh, Student Equity Ambassador Program and the Bias Reporting System. This is indeed the American version of the Chinese communist, the Chinese Cultural Revolution. The critical race theory has its roots in cultural Marxism. It should have no place in our school. Gordon, your reaction to that? I mean, she's saying that the critical race theory agenda is akin to the Chinese revolution that she endured. Your thoughts? She's absolutely right. There are so many hints of what we see today, echoes of, of the Cultural Revolution, which was a decade-long campaign that almost destroyed China. And it was ended only with the death of Mao Zedong in 1976. Um, mm -hmm. She is absolutely 100 percent right when she talks about the parallels. Mm. Well, and, and it's, it's really disturbing that you mentioned TikTok using that app to foment division and, and racial division in the United States with the end of transforming and destroying and dividing the country. And that's exactly what she's charging here, except it's playing out in the school system rather than over the app and on a street. But uh, it's the same mentality. And I, I, was, I was kind of stunned when I heard that. It, it, of course, it rings true. Before we go, Biden is scheduled to meet with Vladimir Putin in Geneva on the 16th. The president's expected to push improved cybersecurity amid a rise in ransomware attacks in the U.S. Uh, now, the United States Intelligence Services is saying 
these attacks are coming from Russian entities. Russia is also a major exporter of gas to Germany and many European nations. Will Biden get any support from Western Europe when it comes to dealing with Russia? I think very little. Um, I mean, maybe with Merkel going, things will get a little bit better, but I doubt it um, because Russia has really intimidated the Europeans into obedience. Uh, and, you know, one thing, Raymond, um, Biden wasn't responsible for the colonial pipeline hack, but he certainly was responsible for the attack on JBS, another ransomware right. attack, because Biden's national security team publicly said after the colonial hack, yeah, it's OK for colonial to pay a ransom. So, so what did he think would happen? So, yeah, we, we've got to go after Putin because he is a bad actor. But we got to remember that Biden opened the door for future ransomware attacks. Yeah. Well, it's a pity that um, the whole Russia collusion thing became a narrative because Trump had a perfect opportunity to forge alliances with Russia that might have brought the temperature down on all of this and created an alliance to check China, which is the larger threat at this moment, and certainly the global menace of the moment. Gordon Chang, thank you for all your insights. You can follow Gordon on Twitter at Gordon G. Chang. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Raymond.